from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 13, Dhritarashtra quits home. Text number 11. Apina Suradas Tata, Pandava Krishna Devata, Rishta Shruta Vayadavaha, Swapuryam Sukhamasate. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Translation My uncle, you must have visited Dwaraka. In that holy place are our friends and well wishers, the descendants of Yadu who are always wrapped in the service of the Lord Sri Krishna. You might have seen them or heard about them. Are they all living happily in their abodes? Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The particular word Krishna Devataha, that is, those who are always wrapped in the service of Lord Krishna, is significant. The Yadavas and the Pandavas who are always wrapped in the thought of the Lord Krishna and his different transcendental activities were all pure devotees of the Lord like Vidura. Vidura left home in order to devote himself completely to the service of the Lord. But the Pandavas and the Yadavas were always wrapped in the thought of Lord Krishna. Thus, there is no difference in their pure devotional qualities. Either remaining at home or leaving home the real qualification of a pure devotee is to become wrapped in the thought of Krishna favorably. That is knowing well that Lord Krishna is the absolute personality of Godhead. Kamsa, Jarasandha, Shishupala and other demons like them were also wrapped in the thought of Lord Krishna. But they were absorbed in a different way, namely unfavorably or thinking him to be a powerful man only. Therefore, Kamsa and Shishupala are not on the same level as pure devotees like Vidura, the Pandavas and the Yadavas. Maharaj Yudhishthira was also always wrapped in the thought of Lord Krishna and his associates at Dwaraka. Otherwise, he could not have asked all about them from Vidura. Maharaj Yudhishthira was therefore on the same level of devotion as Vidura, although engaged in the state affairs of the kingdom of the world. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport. So this verse is describing how Yudhishthira received Vidura in the royal palace and was inquiring from Vidura. So while making inquiries, he is also asking a question about Krishna and his associates in Dwaraka. Since Vidura was on a pilgrimage, he should must have visited the holy place of Dwaraka now, what is the special thing about Dwaraka? Dwaraka was being ruled by Krishna at that time. So, uh, Yudhishthira's specific question is whether the friends and well-wishers of the Pandavas, that is the Yadavas, the descendants of Yadu, Krishna and his associates, whether they are all living happily in their abodes. He is inquiring about their well-being. Particularly he is describing the characteristic or the quality of the residents of Dwaraka. The residents of Dwaraka are all pure devotees of Krishna. In an earlier chapter, it was described how the residents of Dwaraka received Krishna after Krishna was absent for some time when he had left Dwaraka and gone to settle some things in Hastinapura. When the transfer of power had to happen from 
Dhritarashtra or Duryodhana to Yudhishthira. That time Duryodhana refused. Krishna knew this, that uh, Duryodhana is not going to properly hand over power. So therefore Krishna went to settle matters and then the Mahabharata describes how uh, the war became inevitable because Duryodhana refused Yudhishthira, his, uh, Yudhishthira's rightful claim to the uh, kingdom. But Duryodhana challenged and a Kshatriya when challenged never refuses to accept the challenge. This is Kshatriya Dharma. So Yudhishthira was caught in a very uh, tricky situation that on the one hand his rightful claim is being denied and on the other hand Duryodhana is challenging him that if you want the kingdom you fight and you win the battle and you take over the kingdom. So Yudhishthira wanted to avoid this war not because he was afraid of Duryodhana he was quite confident of winning the battle in case the battle took place but then it would be on a very big scale this battle was not just between two kings in a small in a small uh, province because Hastinapura is the seat of the king who rules the whole world it is the seat of the emperor of the world so it's going to be a world war so Yudhishthira knew that world war means millions of uh, kings and their armies will be destroyed So, he did not want such a big massacre to take place just because Duryodhana was adamant to return the kingdom. So, therefore, uh, Yudhishthira reduced his claim. He said, after all, Kshatriyas are duty bound to earn their livelihood by ruling, giving protection to the citizens and collecting taxes and maintaining themselves. So we are satisfied with some small kingdom. But Duryodhana would not give anything at all. Even though finally Yudhishthira reduced his request to just five villages for the five brothers, Pandava brothers. Even that, Duryodhana said, no. This is not Kshatriya spirit, begging. Kshatriya never begs. So he told Yudhishthira, Kshatriyas don't beg. If you want, whatever you want, you fight. So it was not possible for Yudhishthira to avoid the battle. But still, Yudhishthira, being a devotee of Krishna, he requested Krishna, kindly go and do this peace negotiation on my behalf. Now see the relationship between Krishna or the Pandavas and Krishna, between Yudhishthira and Krishna. The Pandavas were completely devoted to Krishna as Krishna's pure devotees. And Krishna, in reciprocation with the pure devotees, he is always looking for an opportunity to render some service to his devotees. So Krishna took it like an opportunity to serve Yudhishthira, his pure devotee. And Krishna immediately went to Duryodhana 
and try to uh, convince Duryodhana to avoid this world war. But Duryodhana was adamant. He said, nothing doing. Then Krishna tried to impress upon Duryodhana that I have come not just as a messenger of Yudhishthira. I am the Supreme Lord and I am warning you of very bad consequences if you don't accept this offer. You are going to lose everything. You are going to be finished. So Krishna, in order to convince Yudhishthira, he showed his universal form, one of the universal forms to Duryodhana. But Duryodhana being a non-devotee, he thought Krishna is using his mystic power somehow to uh, convince uh, Duryodhana. So Duryodhana said, I am not going to be carried away by your show of some mystic power. He still kept on refusing, refusing, refusing. Then Krishna thought, battle is inevitable. And then the battle was fought. So after the battle was fought, Krishna enthroned Yudhishthira as the emperor of the world and returned to Dwaraka. So these Dwaraka residents have been missing Krishna for quite some time. So when Krishna entered Dwaraka, the way they received Krishna is described in detail in a previous chapter. Uh, Lord Krishna's entrance into Dwarka, the 11th chapter. That clearly indicates all the residents of Dwarka are pure devotees of Krishna. All the residents of Dwarka. So, uh, Yudhishthira is inquiring about those pure devotees. They are always in, always wrapped in the service of Lord Sri Krishna. Rap means completely absorbed in seeing, hearing, in acting, in working. So, the, this is the characteristic of a pure devotee. Pure devotees are always absorbed, constantly absorbed, completely, completely absorbed. Either in thinking of Krishna or in hearing about Krishna or in serving Krishna, they are always Krishna conscious. That is the characteristic of a pure devotee. So, we are also uh, instructed to be always thinking of Krishna. Several places in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, always think of me. Manmana bhavamad bhakto madhyaji manamaskuru. Specifically, Krishna tells Arjuna, I am going to now tell you my topmost instruction and my most confidential instruction. Sarva guhyatamam bhuyaha shunume paramam vachaha. Paramam vachaha means my supreme instruction. Because Krishna has given so many instructions to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. So among all of them, which is Krishna's topmost instruction? That Krishna himself clearly spells it out. And he also says this is Krishna's most confidential instruction. Sarva Guhya Tamam. It is the most confidential instruction. Now, why is he telling this most confidential instruction to Arjuna? Uh, to, uh, yes, to Arjuna. Because, Ishto si me drudamiti tato vakshami te hitam. Because you are very dear to me and for your benefit, for your well being. I am giving you this most confidential instruction and it is also my topmost instruction. 
What is that? Man mana bhava mad bhakto madhyaji maam namaskuru. Four specific instructions he gives. The first one he says, always think of me. So this is Krishna's topmost instruction. To always think of Krishna. So how can we always think of Krishna? This will be the question that will naturally arise. Yes, if we want to follow Krishna's instructions in the Bhagavad Gita, the topmost instruction, the most confidential instruction, he is to always think of Krishna. So how do we always think of Krishna? So we have examples of great devotees. In the Krishna book, we have description of Krishna's devotees always being absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. Especially the residents of Vrindavan. Not only residents of Vrindavan, even the residents of Dwaraka, the residents of Mathura, all pure devotees in any place, they are always absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. So, here is a description in the Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, which is summarized by Srila Prabhupada in the Krishna book. So, in the Krishna book, the description is there that as Krishna and Balaram were growing up in Vrindavan, in the house of Nanda Maharaj, so, uh, it is described that both Krishna and Balaram began to crawl on their hands and knees and when they were crawling like that, they pleased their mothers, Rohini and Yashoda. The bells tied to their waist and ankles sound, sounded very fascinating and they would move around very pleasingly. Small children, uh, when they walk, they are not able to walk properly because they just, of course, in the beginning they are just crawling, afterwards they try to get up and start walking. So, their movements are very pleasing to the mother who loves them. So, sometimes, just like ordinary children, they would be frightened by others and would immediately hurry to their mothers for protection. See, we should never forget, Balaram and Krishna are the supreme personality of Godhead. So, they have appeared like small children as a son of two gopis, but actually they are not, uh, not two gopis. Balaram has appeared as a son of the queen of Vasudeva, Rohini. And Krishna has appeared as the son of Devaki, but for protection, sake of protection, Devaki and Vasudeva have hidden him in the house of Nanda Maharaj. Anyway, Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj thought Krishna is their son. They did not know what happened in uh, the middle of the night. Uh, so, uh, Krishna and Balaram are playing like small children in the house of Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda. But actually, they are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, therefore, the scriptures describe their activities as leela, pastimes. What is the purpose of these activities or pastimes? It is simply for giving pleasure to their devotees. For engaging their devotees, the devotees become absorbed in such uh, pastimes of the Lord. Now, not only the devotees who are actually engaged in the pastimes, are absorbed in uh, thought of Krishna, but even those who watch such activities, who observe such activities, and people who describe such activities, and those who hear such activities, descriptions of such activities, everyone can become absorbed in the thoughts of Krishna. That's why 
Shukade Goswami is seriously describing the details to Parikshit Maharaj. Now you should remember the background of Parikshit Maharaj. Parikshit Maharaj has been cursed to die within seven days. And Parikshit has relinquished the post of being the emperor. He has given uh, charge of ruling the world to his son, eldest son. And he has retired and come to the holy place with the intention of preparing himself for facing death. And therefore he wants to hear from the saintly persons spiritual subject matter, spiritual topics. So in response to uh, Parikshit's request, the saintly persons are considering that seven days is very short time for preparing uh, to face death in such a way that one can actually attain ultimate liberation. Seven days is very short time. So while some discussion is going on between the saintly persons and uh, Parikshit, Shukadev Goswami walks into that assembly. And Shukadev Goswami is the recognized topmost transcendentalist of his time. Therefore, he was offered a seat of respect even amongst other great saintly persons. Shukadev Goswami was in comparison to the other saintly persons, he was very young. He was just 16 years old. So by age he was not deserving the kind of special respect that Parikshit Maharaj offered him. By his appearance, he appeared like a madman. Why? Because he was walking around naked, not caring for any social custom. As soon he was, as he was born, he walked away from home, not even caring to undergo any, uh, any samskaras, asamskrita, uncultured, literally it means uncultured, he has not undergone any samskara. And then he was walking around naked. And he was surrounded by what kind of people? Before he attended this assembly, he was surrounded by some urchins. Some laughing at him, some throwing stones, some spitting, some teasing him. He was indifferent to all this, completely indifferent. Why? Because he was absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. Completely within himself, he was absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. So, Actually, he is described as a avadhuta. Avadhuta means somebody who is completely absorbed in thoughts of Krishna within oneself, but externally does not care for any formalities or rituals or any external proper code of conduct, nothing. So they are indifferent. Another example is Jada Bharata. Another example is Lord Rishabdeva towards the end of his life. So, such avadutas are the most advanced transcendentalists, but they don't present themselves that way. So, one of the questions that the sages of Naimisharanya ask uh, Sutta Goswami is that how was uh, Shukade Goswami recognized by Parikshit Maharaj? to be the greatest of transcendentalists. Of course, Parikshit Maharaj himself was a pure devotee. He was himself very, very advanced. So, he could recognize even without any need for external symbols and symptoms. But, the Bhagavatam describes how Parikshit actually uh, when he was preparing to quit his body, 
that time all the great saintly persons from all over the universe they assembled in that spot because they knew parikshit is not just another pious emperor of the world they knew parikshit to be the greatest devotee transcendentalist they knew that so in order to uh, be present at the time of such a great personality quitting his body just like when bhishma quit his body all the great saintly persons from all over the universe assembled in that place because this is the greatest examination for any transcendentalist to remember krishna to think of krishna at the time of death that is the real examination one may practice remembering krishna before death comes one may be even absorbed in remembering krishna thinking of krishna hearing about krishna describing krishna whatever krishna conscious activity but at the time of death what happens the whole bodily arrangement is completely disturbed the prana leaving the body is the most difficult moment in one's life that suddenly the prana is out of the body and the bodily arrangement becomes disturbed because of this what happens the mind the intelligence and the ego is completely uh, shaken so while in this gross body we are utilizing the subtle body to engage the gross body to utilize the gross body so whatever it be whatever the activity we may be engaged in we are utilizing our subtle body our mind intelligence at least our mind and intelligence so if that mind and intelligence is completely disturbed how can we remember krishna how can we chant krishna's name how can we do that so all transcendentalists are aware of this this is the most difficult moment so they want to learn from expert transcendentalists at the difficult time at the moment of death how to quit the body perfectly so bhishma was a very good example parikshit was another example so they all assembled to observe parikshit putting his body they all observed uh, they all assembled so all of them had assembled there and this discussion was going on when shukade goswami walked into the assembly so some of the greatest of the recognized saintly persons Uh, they stood up in respect for receiving shukadev goswami so when they because they could study the facial features and through the face they could read the mind so they could recognize here is a very 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 advanced transcendentalist just by his facial features so because they could read and recognize so they stood up and taking the cue from these great saintly persons everybody else stood up in respect including parikshit maharaj and parikshit maharaj since he was inquiring from all the saintly persons he knew that shukadev goswami is the most uh qualified person 
a saintly person to give me advice what I should do next seven days. And Shukare Goswami was offered the seat of respect in that assembly. And then Shukare Goswami began to speak. Now Shukare Goswami is speaking some very serious subject matter. So there is no uh, room for describing some uh, child's play. Sometimes, you know, when uh, family members meet, if there is a small child at home, they'll describe the child's uh, uh, childish activities. Out of love, the parents or the mother may describe, oh, my child walks so nicely, plays so nicely, sings so nicely. So out of love, the mother may say that. Now others out of courtesy or whatever, to encourage the child or encourage the parents, they may also sit and hear. But this is not considered very serious discussion about self-realization. So many times, those who are serious uh, students of uh, scriptures, they don't uh, study all these uh, Puranas. Puranas describe so many historical incidents about kings and dynasties. And, and especially the Bhagavata Purana is describing something about childish activities of some Krishna. So, serious transcendentalists, those who are non-devotees, they say, oh, we have nothing to do with all that. Even when they study Bhagavad Gita, First chapter, they completely ignore or they just simply recite that without bothering to go into the details of the meaning and the, and the actual verses. No. The real, this thing is Dehi no sminyatha dehe kaumaram yogunam. So they study only those portions which describe we are the soul, spirit soul. Yeah. All those type of portions. Uh, all that conversation, Arjuna telling that I am bewildered, my uh, uh, hands are trembling and my uh, mind is reeling, all that, that is not important. So similarly, they also ignore and neglect such descriptions that Mother Yashoda was always anxious about baby Krishna. So what have we got to do with all these activities, descriptions of such activities? Shukadeva Goswami, mind you, is seriously describing all this to Parikshit Maharaj. And Parikshit Maharaj is awaiting death. He has no time to sit and hear some uh, uh, childish activities of some small child. No. So, even Parikshit Maharaj is seriously sitting and hearing. So, Shukade Goswami is describing these activities because if you carefully study the Bhagavatam, you will understand. While describing the various dynasties, Shukade Goswami just mentioned about Krishna and Balaram in the ninth canto while describing the the Yadu dynasty, the kings in the Yadu dynasty. So he briefly mentioned about Krishna and Balaram. Immediately Parikshit, after he completed describing all the dynasties, immediately at the beginning of the end of ninth canto, there is the end of description of all these dynasties. That Parikshit had asked and Shukadeva Goswami had described. So, beginning of first, 10th uh, canto, uh, Parikshit Maharaj is telling, kindly describe more details about Krishna. Why? Because he is glorifying descriptions of Krishna, Krishna Katha. Krishna Katha is not ordinary story, ordinary history. Krishna Katha can actually uh, help one 
become completely cleansed in the heart of all material contamination. So for those who are completely engaged in materialistic activities, simply by hearing Krishna Katha, they can be completely purified of all sinful reactions. They can become completely pure. Those who are desiring liberation, very easily they can get liberation simply by hearing Krishna Katha. And further, Parikshit says, those who are already liberated, for them there is no better subject matter to hear than the descriptions of Krishna, Krishna Katha. So he compares Krishna Katha to the waters of the river Ganges. Just like the river Ganges, while flowing through the whole universe, it purifies all the people of the upper, middle and lower planetary systems. Similarly, Krishna Katha can purify all three categories of persons. Those who are completely materially absorbed, those who are seeking liberation, and those who are already liberated. All three categories of persons can benefit by hearing Krishna Katha. Therefore, kindly describe in detail about Krishna. Kindly describe all those activities which Krishna performed when he incarnated in this world as the son of Vasudeva and Devaki. So, therefore, Shukra Goswami begins the description and after describing some of these uh, childish activities of uh, Krishna, he says, don't think that Krishna is an ordinary child or simply a, a, a very beautiful, loving son of Mother Yashoda or Devaki. No. Who is Krishna? Itham satam brahma sukhanu bhutya. Krishna is the object of those who desire brahma sukha, those who want spiritual happiness. How is Krishna the object of such persons? Those who desire to merge into the Brahman effulgence, into the Brahma Jyoti, Krishna is the source of that Brahma Jyoti. What is Brahma Jyoti? It is Krishna's bodily effulgence. Dasyam Gatanam Paradaivatena. Krishna is the object of worship for his devotees, for the devotees who are engaged in bhakti. They are always engaged in worshipping Krishna. Dasyam gatanam paradaivatena. They recognize he is the supreme lord, supreme personality of Godhead and they worship him always. Mayashritanam Naradarakena. Whereas there are others who are completely absorbed in illusion, they consider Krishna as another ordinary human child. Sakam Vijagruhu Krutapunya Punjaha. Now, who are these covered boys who are engaged with Krishna? Are they some ordinary covered boys? No. They are the most fortunate beings in the entire creation that they have got this opportunity to play with Krishna after having accumulated heaps of pious activities. Krita Punya Punja. Sakam Vijagru. They are engaged in some play with Krishna. The Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, Shukare Goswami is giving this warning to people who may think that if somebody thinks Krishna is an ordinary child, they are actually completely, totally in 
illusion it's only because somebody is absorbed in illusion that they may think including those who are engaged in serious study of the scriptures only because of being in illusion they think that such descriptions of krishna in the shrimad bhagavatam are actually nothing to do with self realization so simply by being absorbed in hearing about krishna one can always be wrapped in thought of krishna like the pandavas and the yadavas therefore shila prabhupad says that he has presented this shrimad bhagavatam and especially has presented the krishna book simply by reading the krishna book every day you can go back to god it what was possible for parikshit maharaj what is possible for all the great devotees all the great transcendentalists including bhishma and parikshit is very easily possible for all of us if we simply absorb ourselves in hearing or reading or describing these pastimes of krishna and his incarnations as described in the shrimad bhagavatam therefore it is not a very difficult thing the examples are given just like mother yashoda she was always absorbed in thought of krishna by being always anxious to serve krishna so the anxiety for engaging in devotional service to krishna is also very good for the devotees sometimes devotees when they are engaged in krishna service if they face some difficulty or some so called obstacles actually there cannot be any obstacles in krishna service but sometimes we feel there are some obstacles and if the obstacles give rise to some anxiety then others may wonder why these devotees are undergoing so much anxiety while they are engaged in devotional service to krishna why can't krishna remove all their anxiety so anxiety experienced in serving krishna is actually completely transcendental it is spiritual it has got the same effect as doing krishna service without any anxiety there is no difference both are uh, uh, meant for our spiritual advancement our purification so such anxiety prabhupada terms it as krishna anxiety krishna anxiety prabhupada writes in one letter to one devotee who wrote to prabhupada that i am having too much anxiety in doing service what should i do to get rid of this anxiety so that i can nicely serve krishna prabhupada says krishna anxiety is very good so just like mother yashoda and rohini i'll just read this portion uh, krishna and balram were so restless that their mothers yashoda and rohini would try to protect them from cows bulls monkeys water fire birds while they were executing their household duties always being anxious to protect the children and to execute their duties they were not at all very tranquil they were not very peaceful always anxious where is krishna what is he doing is some uh, monkey coming and disturbing him or some he is holding on to some calf tail and the calf will suddenly out of fear start running away and krishna gets rolled on the on the cow cow shed ground and smears himself completely with cow dung then again mother yashoda has to bring him clean him nicely smear sandalwood pulp and decorate him again with all the ornaments so always mother yashoda was in anxiety for krishna and when krishna goes cow herding what is mother yashoda doing uh, mother yashoda it is described here uh, she would always 
Mother Yashoda was singing about the childhood activities of Krishna. It was formerly a custom that if anyone wanted to remember something constantly, such a person would transform it into poetry or have it done by a professional poet. It appears that Mother Yashoda did not want to forget Krishna's activities at any time. Therefore, she poeticized all of Krishna's childhood activities such as killing of Putana, killing of Aghasura, killing of Shakatasura, killing of Trunavarta. And while churning the butter, she sang about these activities in poetical form. Thus, she was always absorbed in thought of Krishna. Always singing about Krishna's activities. Always. She herself would compose poems in her own way. Not that they would necessarily conform to some poetical rules. Simply some... In Karnataka, we have this Janapada Gita, uh, folk songs. Uh, anybody can compose without necessarily following rules. And just they sing, very, very easily they sing such uh, uh, folk songs. So about Krishna also, Mother Yashoda would compose some songs and sing. In this way, she would always be wrapped in thought of Krishna. So the gopis, while Krishna was away cowherding, they would always be singing about Krishna or describing Krishna or discussing about Krishna. This was the way gopis were always wrapped in thought of Krishna. All the residents of Vrindavan, always thinking of Krishna. Never, for one moment, they would forget Krishna. So, Lord Chaitanya has also instructed us that to always think of Krishna means, specifically Lord Chaitanya says, to always chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. This is another instruction we have been given to always think of Krishna, to means to always chant Hare Krishna. This Prabhupada describes in the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita. So, whenever our tongue is free and we can softly chant Hare Krishna, we should do so. So, we should get into this habit while bathing, while walking, Mataji is while cooking in the kitchen or you are doing some other work, ordinary work, which does not involve your tongue you can keep chanting softly Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. So this is apart from, of course, this should not be, not become your uh, uh, fixed number of rounds that you chant on beads. That is separate. That should be done without any other work being done simultaneously. But apart from your 16 rounds or whatever number of rounds you are chanting every day as Japa, Apart from the vrata of doing japa, at all other times you can keep chanting Hare Krishna uh, using your tongue. So, also the example is given of Maharaj Ambarisha. Maharaj Ambarisha, even though he was the emperor of the world, it is very nicely described how he always was Krishna conscious. So he engaged all his senses, his mind, his thoughts in Krishna consciousness. So I'll quickly read this. Maharaj Ambarisha always engaged his mind in meditating upon the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. His words in describing the glories of the Lord. His hands in cleansing the Lord's temple. His ears in hearing the words spoken by Krishna or about Krishna. He engaged his eyes in seeing the deity of Krishna and he engaged his, of course it said here, he engaged his eyes in seeing the deity of Krishna, he engaged his eyes in seeing the temples of Krishna, he engaged his eyes in seeing the places of Krishna's pastimes like Mathura, Vrindavan, etc. He engaged his senses, he engaged his sense of smelling in smelling the fragrance of tulsi offered to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. 
he engaged his tongue in tasting krishna prasadam he engaged his legs in walking to the holy places and temples of the lord he engaged his head in bowing down before the lord he engaged all his desires in serving the supreme lord 24 hours a day even his desires were simply desires how i can serve krishna this itself becomes a meditation on krishna apart from your routine uh, devotional service which is sadhana bhakti practice like chanting doing some puja uh, reading some scriptures apart from that other times how you can actually engage in krishna service so you have you can think about this every opportunity to think of krishna to chant hari krishna or to somehow render some service to krishna even while engaged in ordinary activities material duties so called material duties uh, even thinking about that itself is krishna consciousness even that is krishna consciousness that is called being wrapped in the thought of lord krishna so there is beautiful description of uh, maharaj ambarisha i'll just read this last portion and then close the class how maharaj ambarisha was able to give up all attachment to household affairs wives children friends relatives the best of powerful elephants to beautiful chariots to horses to inexhaustible jewels to ornaments to garments to inexhaustible treasury how was he able to give up all this attachment so the description is given that uh, in the month of kartik after observing that vow of kartik uh, masa uh, uh, he observed a fast for 3 nights and after bathing in the yamuna he worshiped the supreme personality of god hari in madhuvana following the regulated principles of mahabhishek maharaj ambarish performed the bathing ceremony for the deity of lord krishna with all paraphernalia and then he dressed the deity with fine clothing ornaments fragrant flower garlands other paraphernalia for worship of the lord she following the footsteps of maharaj ambarisha worshiping krishna in that way shrila rupa goswami has given janmashtami tithi vidhi how to observe the uh, birthday uh, ceremony of lord krishna janmashtami so he has given elaborate procedure for performing the mahabhishek sometimes people think devotees are very sentimental they offer some fruit juice in abhishek to krishna this is not our uh, sentiment it is prescribed in the janmashtami tithi vidhi by shrila rupa goswami it is a shastra it is scripture it's a scriptural injunction how to perform mahabhishek falodaka follow the kind of course water that washes the fruits uh, even phala rasa that is also used for bathing the supreme lord uh, so this is all in following the footsteps of great uh, devotees like ambarish hmm? so ambarish maharaj after worshiping krishna in that way what did he do he satisfied all the guests who had arrived at his house especially the brahmanas he gave in charity 60 crores of cows whose horns were covered with gold plate and whose hooves were covered with silver plate so what is the lesson for us for a householder to lose attraction or attachment for the household wealth or household paraphernalia is possible by giving in charity to krishna or krishna's devotees this is the only way there is no other way 
Ambarish Maharaj is teaching by his example. 60 crores of cows he gave away in charity. That means always he was depleting his treasury. He was depleting his treasury because these cows were not just given as cows. You carefully hear. These cows whose horns were covered with gold plate and whose hooves were covered with silver plate. So how much of gold and silver he would have given? 60 crore cows. So a householder's possessions are purified by giving in charity to Krishna or Krishna's devotees. We should specifically, all householders should remember this. There is no other way. No other effective way, let me say this. There is no other effective way of losing attachment. By doing this, he became completely detached from all his possessions. He was completely detached from all his possessions. So I'll stop here. Rantara Srimad Bhagavatam ki jaya shila Prabhupada ki jaya. Hare Krishna, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss any updates.